Hello, everyone, and uh, welcome to our first Islandora 8 webinar. Uh, my colleague Danny Lamb, our technical lead at the Islandora Foundation, is going to give you an overview of the first release, uh, maybe demo a few things, and then we will have time at the end for your questions. Um, so, got everybody muted for now. Well, we'll work on selective unmuting when question period comes up. And thank you very much for joining us. Okay. I guess that's my cue. Hello. All right. Uh, as Melissa said, I'm Danny Lamb. Uh, and I'm going to step you through uh, kind of a general overview of Islandora 8, kind of a, a bird's eye view of the software. Uh, talk a little bit about what you can expect in terms of functionality and features, and then I'll show you how you can get your hands on it. And then after that, we'll do a little uh, demo, and you can ask me some questions. Um, so we'll just go ahead and, and roll right in. That can be a lot for an hour, especially depending on if there's a lot of questions. Uh, so let's get moving. Um, okay, get control of my screen here. Hmm. I appear to be having technical difficulties. Okay, can folks see it now? I, uh, I lost control of things there for a second. Okay. Here we go. Sorry about that. Okay. So uh, in general, when people think of Islandora, uh, generally what, what comes to mind is that Islandora combines Drupal 8 and a Fedora Commons repository. Um, just as a kind of quick overview of what those two key technologies are, uh, Drupal 8, it's, a, it's an open source CMS. Uh, it's supported by a very large, very active community. Um, it has a lot of uh, large institutions that are using it, uh, in particular like the US government uses uh, Drupal as a content management system. Um, it's got good support for web and accessibility standards, which is pretty crucial. Um, and, and really, you know, the main benefit here is that it's got a, a very powerful interface that you can interact with and you can use that to really build up a website without having to write any code, any HTML or JavaScript, and you don't have to, you know, mess around with the database and stuff like that. It kind of, it kind of does all of that for you. Um, Fedora 5 is the next version of uh, the Fedora Commons uh, repository that was just somewhat recently put out. Um, we ended up actually going straight from three to five on this as we developed Islandora 8. Uh, we went all the way through kind of the life cycle of four and now we're just straight shipping with five, which is a good thing um, because it has a lot of features that we, that we like and use. Um, so Fedora as a repository, um, it's got, uh, configurable disk storage. It can generate fixity digest for you if you want to do some checksum checking. Um, when you slice versions, it does it in the memento format, which is really neat. That's like the Wayback Machine compliant um, format. So if you want to be able to actually have your Fedora get uh, slurped up by the Wayback Machine or be compatible with that, that, that can happen. Um, instead of Exactable now, it uses uh, WebAC or Web Access Control policies. Um, and one of the big uh, features that's new to Fedora 5 that I can see now is getting cut off by the Fedora symbol here is that it can it can proxy or redirect to external content, which is really nice. Um, so you might not want to store necessarily all of your uh, very, very large files in Fedora for reasons. Maybe you don't want to serve them all that often, or maybe they're just so huge you don't really want to um, transfer them around. Um, and so what you can do is you can still use Fedora to track your technical metadata uh, about the file, but then when you go to click on it, it'll actually just um, redirect you right back to it or pretend like it's serving it, but actually just serve it from, from where it's located, which is pretty nice. Um, and it also has a, an audit trail feature. So it, it handles a lot of the preservation -y features. So Drupal is uh, what your users are going to really interact with and they're going to get a website and content and you can see all of that. But then behind the scenes, 
um, it's all going to get kind of quietly flushed back into a into a Fedora five to to preserve for later. Um, now, calling Islandora just Drupal and Fedora is a bit misleading because there's actually a whole lot going on, and and there's a lot that we do. Um, we have a lot of different services uh, and viewers that we interact with. Um, for example, uh, uh, Solar for searching, right? Like these are all pretty large key features that are, are beyond the realm of just you know Drupal and Fedora, but they're all things that you know you add it all together, you get a nice repository. Uh, the analogy that we used to do for this um, in the previous version, Nile Door Seven, was that it was a it was a cheeseburger, and we could kind of name all of the layers, um, and especially like you know. Uh, Solar is optional in Island Dora, but everyone still uses it. It's, uh, so that's why it's the cheese, because cheese always makes everything better, right? Um, and, and this is a good, very simple uh, way to convey what the stack um, is in a way that's you know, pretty easily digestible, if you'll excuse the pun. Um, in Island Dora 8, our kind of next version of this graphic here is instead of saying uh, it's a hamburger with with layers, uh, and instead we're saying that it's it's a bento box. So everything is kind of neatly arranged where it needs to be, and nothing touches uh, unless it's supposed to. Um, we haven't gone through the exercise of actually, you know, saying if the piece of salmon is solar or, you know, what the wasabi is and stuff like that. Maybe we'll get there. Um, but this is our, our our new graphic that we're kind of floating around now, the bento box. Um, and if you if you want uh, kind of the obligatory, uh, complicated technical diagram that must go with all presentations, then I, I have one for you. Here's a, a slightly more detailed depiction um, of an Islandora 8 install. And for the most part here, we have some, some Drupal modules that we write. And all of this stuff that's in this nice teal color this is all stuff that we have written. This is all Islandora. This plus some some Drupal modules. Um, the triple store solar and all these other things that have logos. This is we we don't write this. We just use this this stuff. Um, but the the general idea here is that you've got a Drupal eight which you will interact with. Um, some things happen at the Drupal level where they will go and interact with other services. For example, uh, your Drupal content is directly indexed into Solar. Uh, there's no middleman there. We just use a Drupal module for it. Similarly, when you're connecting to your storage services, this is done with uh, another Drupal module called Fly System. Um, and so it directly does that. Other than that, for the most part, um, everything goes asynchronously onto a message broker, and then in the back end, we've got this uh, chunk of Java called Alpaca that will then orchestrate basically connecting your repository content in Drupal with these various other services uh, that we've got going on. Um, now, this is still kind of glossing over some things. I'm still painting with some pretty broad strokes here. There's quite a few more uh, pieces to the puzzle. So the bento box analogy is nice, but we actually have a, a very large bento box with many, many, many compartments here. Um, but for the most part, as you can see, there's no crossed wires here. Everything's pretty clean, and it goes exactly uh, to where it's going to go. And things are generally very boxed in, and pieces of the stack don't really know about each other. And that's part of how we can keep things very uh, scalable and, and swappable. Um, but moving on here, we'll get past this because I don't think this really does it it, it justice, really. Um, let me talk about some of the different components that we have here uh, that I that are in the, the diagram, and then we'll we'll move on to, to the features. So I mentioned earlier this fly system component here. Um, what this does is this is uh, a, a generally a file system abstraction layer. Um, and so you can basically swap out file systems um, wherever they may be. They could be uh, local disks on your hard drive. It could be network attached storage. It could be through some sort of cloud service provider. Um, it doesn't matter. It all treats everything kind of the same way. Um, and if you notice in this, in this diagram here, um, the Fedora component actually gets pointed to twice. 
So from fly system, um, it points to Fedora here because when you're working with it as just files, it's just your binaries, um, it uses fly system to do that sort of, of interaction for you. So when you're in PHP, you get some nice syntax here, you get some kind of syntactic uh, sugar that you can, you can work with. But really what it does is it just normalizes how you handle everything. So your Drupal is federating basically all of this content that's in all of these uh, potentially you know, multiple places here with all these different uh, services that you can kind of take advantage of. So there's adapters for um, your Fedora, which is what we wrote, and then kind of everything else that we get from the Drupal modules here um, are you know, other hard drives, uh, Amazon S3, Dropbox, Rackspace, OpenStack. Um, you can just use like SFTP or FTP and just talk to an FTP server if you want. You can, you can pretty much put and access your files anywhere if you're using Fly System. Um, so what this means is that for us, uh, your repository is never going to run out of space again. I mean, as long as you can pay for more space, right? So you can just keep attaching disks um, or you can farm things out to a, to a service provider. Just use AWS buckets, you know, kind of whatever you want to do. You can put your files wherever. And because we use external content with Fedora, all of that metadata for all those files, it still gets tracked and preserved. Um, the other kind of main component of this of this diagram here um, are our microservices. These are sort of all of the other little pieces that we touch, and uh, it gets a little you know enterprisey, vendory, uh, you know buzzwordy here when you start talking about microservices, uh, and you hear this kind of get tossed around a lot. Um, but really, all they are. It's just very small, single-purpose applications. They don't have anything to do with Drupal. They don't have anything to do with Fedora. They're just these little web services that we have running um, that we talk to. So we use them for everything from um, putting your RDF metadata into Fedora. Like the binary gets handled by Fly System, but all that RDF, it all gets handled with a microservice. Um, creating derivatives is all done with microservices. Um, the fixity checking and preservation features we have a microservice for called RipRap. Um, and there's one getting worked on now, Island or a bagger, uh, that could uh, basically wrap up your content for export and, and bags, right? Um, and the reason why we do this is that really it's, it's scalable. Now all of these, although they're, they're simple and single purpose, some of the operations these things have to do are, are pretty computationally intensive, right? Like converting video. Um, that's a pretty heavy task. And it's not something that you want running on your web server because people are trying to view files um, and you don't want this thing choking up converting a very large video. So the fact that everything can run on these web services means that they can all run on other boxes. You're not tied to keeping your entire deployment onto a single server. Um, and then once you can break it off once, you can scale out that way, and then you can start actually scaling it up. If you need more, you can start spinning up more servers and put load balancers in front of it. And you know, eventually, there's far more sophisticated techniques, right? But you can you can go down the road of really maximizing the performance of your repository um, because we have these microservices. Another benefit is that uh, you can swap them out. If you don't like it, you can swap it out. They they all pretty much have an API that they follow. They all follow generally the same pattern and we do it in PHP, but if you don't like it, you're a Python guy or something, then you can just write whatever you want in whatever language you want. And generally, as long as it follows the same API, everything's going to work out. Um, so it's, it's very scalable and it's very flexible. And so that's why we went with this architecture. And that really is what kind of makes this whole thing the bento box. All these the little components you know, will each have their own compartment, basically. That's really the microservices. Um, so okay, uh, I'll I'll stop there because I'm already starting to get into the weeds and we're getting pretty technical, um, and I'm I'm trying to stay away from that. I uh, have it have a habit of doing that as tech lead. Um, so let's maybe start talking about just generally the um, features that you're going to see and just really kind of the look and feel and what what to expect um, the first time you play with an Island or a instance. Um, so the the first thing you'll see is that. Everything is in the GUI. Um, we very consciously, obsessively, perhaps even excessively, 
push everything into configuration. And we do that because we really want this software to put power into the hands of the users, into the repository admins that are doing it. Um, and so we really pushed as much as we could into forms and into configuration. And because you can do that, then all those forms that then drive all that configuration can actually get uh, exported and shared around and passed around from, from site to site. Um, and so it's just a very good experience from a user. There's a lot of things in Islandora 8 that you can do in the UI that you could not have done um, in Islandora 7. And then your end result of that, that configuration from all of your big setup, that can all be just exported and then slurped into another site very easily uh, using using Drupal and, and particularly features. Um, we, we also have a lot of what you would consider business logic um, built into something called Drupal Context. Drupal Context is a lot like rules, but it's this another way that we have of giving repository admins forms for controlling the way that their repository behaves. So it's not just configuration in the sense like I want this checkbox off or on or something, but it's more like when do I do things and then how can I trigger them? So we use context for everything like if a file comes in and it's of a certain type, then we generate these types of derivatives. And all of that, every step of that process is completely configurable with a form. Everything down to the parameters you want to pass into image magic, um, tab it, generate your thumbnail kind of thing. It's very deeply, deeply configurable. Um, and a bit of a learning curve there, but fortunately, this is all Drupal stuff. So it's, it's pretty easy to, to pick up once you get your sea legs. Um, the next kind of main takeaway here um, is that all of your content are native Drupal entities, Drupal nodes. Um, and because all of your content is in the native Drupal format, anything you can do in Drupal, you can do with your Island or content. Now, this is huge. Um, this is pretty game changing, in fact. Um, what this means is now all of the contributed modules that we had been kind of barred from using before in Island Door 7 because everything we had was so Island Door specific. Um, now that everything is kind of stock or vanilla Drupal, we don't make any of our own custom entities. Now all of those third-party modules on Drupal.org are available to use. So all of the tools that that larger other community has built, we, we now have access to and can use quite effectively to, to great effect. Um, so some examples of what you can do, um, you know, badges, like you want a Pinterest badge or you want to like have a link that'll like, you know, share on Facebook or something, they got modules for that. Um, you want to make like a, a Google map and drop some pins on it because you've got some things that are tagged with locations. Well, there's, there's a module for that. Um, you want to make a store. Uh, you want to sell copies of the things that you're preserving. They, there's a module for that, right? Um, and that's in addition to all of the other kind of um, awesome things that you get just from core Drupal, you know, like being able to control how things look or categorize content uh, or even Drupal views, which are, are super awesome and powerful. And I'll definitely show you some examples uh, of those. But you can do a whole lot with your site now because this content is now Drupal content um, and not a special thing that we've made kind of layered on top of Drupal. Um, because it is native Drupal, what that really means is now your metadata is in a database. Um, it's not in XML, it's not stored in a file um, in your Fedora, unless you want it to be. Um, it is natively stored within a database. Um, because you control all of your content modeling using Drupal and fields, and that is just the way that Drupal works. So we just roll with it here, and so we take advantage of the fact that things are in the database, and this actually lets us do some pretty um, incredible things. Um, if you want other formats like XML, or JSON, or we have, of course, RDF to go into Fedora, you can serialize the data from the database 
into other formats. Um, but if you're working with something, it is not working with it in that format. There is no native format. It's not XML and everything's XML or JSON and everything's JSON. It's, it's none of that. It's, it lives in a database and then we convert it into those when we need to. Um, and because we're using the database and because we get to use Drupal 8 entities, um, you can essentially, through the UI, you can create metadata profiles for all your different types of objects. We call these content types um, in Drupal. And, and, and another kind of big benefit of it is, is that we can then perform batch operations on all of these entities and stuff. Um, using Drupal tooling around stuff that's in the database. Um, and I'll show you some examples of that too with use bulk operations. Like you can just do a lot of really incredible, powerful stuff um, that would have been somewhat difficult to do before in Island Door 7. And again, all, all through a user interface. Um, some of the kind of basic things you can expect to do without even any third party modules. Um, you will be able to control how your objects look. You can choose what metadata to show or not show. You can choose what viewer to present the files in. You can edit the form, what um, people are allowed to see, when they edit it, who's allowed to see that stuff. Um, you can even swap form modes for people. So if you have different people of various roles in your organization and maybe you want a simplified, smaller form for someone, um, you, can, you can do that. Um, you can categorize all of your content with taxonomy terms, which is something that we do extensively in Islandora in the software, and you can totally take advantage of that. Um, you can create your own controlled vocabularies, uh, and you can use the terms in that vocabulary to, to categorize your content. And then when you do that, um, you get a lot of nice kind of bonus things for free from Drupal because it's got a lot of tools set up to work with, with taxonomy terms and vocabularies like that. Um, we also leverage Drupal's core actions, which means that you can you know, go on your site and then just trigger actions for a particular um, file. And using that uh, module I mentioned before, views bulk operations, um, you can end up just through the UI, you know, you got this list of things that pop up and you can just click, click, click on the ones you want and then you can, boom, you can just go execute kind of actions on, on all of them. Um, everything from like re-indexing in the triple store to regenerating derivatives to, to all kinds of stuff. Um, we take basically every kind of single unit of work you could do that's reasonable to do so and we put it into an action because then it becomes configurable and then it gets a form and you get all these nice Drupal things. Um, out of it. And I already mentioned context um, before, but boy, we use it a lot. And it's something that once you see what you can do with it, you realize it's really like this crazy, you know, control panel for your entire repository. And you have a lot of control over what happens, what gets into Fedora, what doesn't get into Fedora, what gets indexed into the triple store, you know, how you create the derivatives, all of this stuff is now all controlled uh, through, through a dashboard in Drupal. Um, right now with our 1.0.0 release, we do support a handful of types out of the box. Um, you don't have to do anything automatically configure, configured. You spin up a site, you've got this. Um, you can upload images, audio files, video files, PDFs. You can make collections. And then we kind of have a, like a generic bucket for everything else that we don't know what to do with yet. We, we just call those binaries. Um, but we have really good support for all of these. We have derivatives support for all of these. Um, we can extract frames and um, from video to make thumbnails. We can extract, you know, like the first page of your PDFs. So you can get a picture uh, of it. Um, we convert video and audio. We convert images. Um, we can do a whole lot of things. Um, but what we don't do yet, and this is coming soon. Um, we don't quite have support yet for what we're calling complex objects. Um, things where there would be um, multiple different files that would need to be aggregated in some way. Something like uh, a book where you have a scan of each page or a newspaper um, or serials in a journal or, you know, generic quote unquote 
compound objects. Um, and so we're working on that. And it's not really a, an issue of the, you know, technically what's happening. There's not some technical programming reason um, why we're not there yet. It's mostly just because as we're all working together on this, we're finding out what's the best way to do this in Drupal and then how do we take the best way to do this in Drupal and have it make sense in your Fedora. And so we really just need to kind of come to a consensus on how we're going to do these multi-page objects. And that really just comes down to experience and, and people trying it. And a handful of people have tried and a handful more are about to try with their pilot projects. And so I think, you know, by the end of it, um, we'll put all of our heads together and, and find that middle ground somewhere. What we think as a community is really the best way to go forward with these types of objects. Um, I guess the, the last thing I want to mention, and I mentioned this only because it, we held up the release for a couple days over this, um, and it's a, it's a pretty important uh, and I think crucial feature to the software, uh, which is that we, we support multilingual content. Uh, this is a, a native Drupal feature that we had to do a bit of work in order to make sure that it, everything worked out properly in the back end. So you could make your multilingual content in Drupal, but that didn't really guarantee anything in the rest of the stack. So we took our time to make sure that all of your content that you go and translate and you had these translations for, that all of that metadata gets tagged appropriately with the correct language tags in the RDF and that it does make it into Fedora with the proper RDF and the triple store and that you can search the triple store based on language and stuff like that. Um, so we have very robust multilingual content support um, now. So you can go in, you can say, I want a language, pick a language, it lists all of them in a drop down box. Um, and then every time you make something, you have the ability to go translate it into, into one or more languages, whatever you, you set up. And the administrative interface itself, all the things like add content and, you know, like um, admin structure, you know, the whole like admin toolbar thing, all of that stuff can be translated as well. Um, so here you can see in our example here with this, I guess it's a wombat. Um, all of the, some of the field values have been converted into Tamil and also some of the actual like field descriptions and the, and the title and stuff like that as well. You can also, you can go all the way through though and set up the whole, you know, website and, and for all of your users that are generating content, if you want that to be in another language, you can do that as well. Um, which is a, which is a pretty, pretty amazing feature. Um, Okay, so I kind of went over a brief overview of what we, of what you can do and what you can expect. Um, maybe if you're curious, you would like to try it. And if you would like to try it, um, we have a couple of options. So you can go to our sandbox, future.islandor.ca, and don't worry, I've got links to everything here in the slides, and the slides are all, it's all going to be made available. Um, but we have future.islandware.ca. That's our sandbox. You can go check it out. I've actually got it on lockdown right now because I'm going to use it to do some demos. So I've blocked our test user. Um, but as soon as we're done, we'll, we'll unblock the test user and you can, you can get back in. That's just so the rug doesn't get pulled out from under me while I demo. Um, but that site will be periodically refreshed. So if you make something and then you want to come check it out a couple of days later and it's gone, you know, don't be surprised. We just kind of wipe it every once in a while when things when people go and mess with it, because it is so infinitely configurable, um, people can get in there and really start playing around with it. So it's best just to kind of put things back in their place every once in a while. Um, if you want to actually try to install it, install it, um, you can use our Ansible playbook. We have an installer for the whole stack. You can use it to spin up a development environment. And if you want to use Vagrant, you can just basically, you know, if you download VirtualBox, Vagrant, Ansible, pull this down and type Vagrant up, um, it's going to spin up a local instance for you to work with. This is how all the development is done on Islandor 8. Uh, all the developers are all using this. Um, it's also what we use to spin up this sandbox. So you can totally use this playbook to provision uh, a live environment. It doesn't have to be on your machine. It can be on another machine or even multiple machines if you really know Ansible. Um, but right now, we just like can use it very easily to make kind of a kitchen sink build and just um, slap it on a server somewhere. Future.ondoor.ca is on DigitalOcean. You can, you know, AWS, DO, whatever you want. You got uh, a local machine running vSphere or something at your organization. If you can 
if you can get uh, a shell and log into it and put Python on it, you can you can put Islandor on there with Ansible. Um, or you can just go download the OVA. So when we made the build, I just went ahead and extracted out an OVA. It's there for you to download. It's like four gigs or something. It's kind of big. Um, and it's just up in my Google Drive. But you can totally just go download it um, and spin it up and try it out. And when you do turn it on, just be aware that all of the ports are, are kind of switched. So instead of just going to the site and hitting enter, you got to make sure that you put it at port 8000 to see it. But other than that, and we do that for development purposes. Um, but you can just go and snag the OVA if you want to, if you want to just go download something and double click it and try it. If that's, you know, more up your alley, then that's, it's available for you. Um, so that's how you can go get the software if you want to evaluate it for yourself or for your organization. Um, and now I guess I'm going to try it uh, <laughs> with this nice image of a, of a Van der Graaff generator. Um, but let's go ahead and try to bottle some lightning here. Huh? So I'm going to show you the sandbox. And then I'm going to add some, some content to it. And then I'm going to show you how you can kind of monkey with it a bit. Um, so just really, you know, brief intro demo here. Um, I'm going to go ahead and get out of demonstration mode here. And then I will go to the sandbox. So here's the sandbox. Um, you can see we've got this nice slideshow. That's a view. We get that for free because it's Drupal content natively. Um, but if we go here, I'm going to go ahead and add something to it. So we've got collections here. We have a collection of dog pictures and a collection of cat pictures. Okay, and you can see we get this nice kind of image gallery of everything that's in it. Um, at, that also is a view, I might add. Um, and so I'm going to go ahead and make another collection. I'm going to make, these are all images, so I'll make a collection that holds some PDFs and we'll put some PDFs in it and then we'll, we'll see what that looks like. Um, so the way that you add content in Islandora 8 is you use the quote unquote add content button that we've generally ignored all through Islandora 7. Um, of course, we removed it from, from the site, but it's the same thing here. You click on content, you have an add content button, and you can just go ahead and, and, and add what you want. So we created our own content type here called repository item. When you install it, you get this for free. Um, and it's not sacred. Once you get it, it's yours. You go edit it however you want. You manipulate it however you want. Um, you got your own metadata profile you want to throw in there. You can use this as a starting point, um, or you can create your own and just look at it as a, as a way of kind of figuring out what you're doing. Um, but we provide this just as a, as a great starting point for you. So we're going to go ahead and use it. And I'm just going to say this is our PDF collection. OK, and I'm going to skip. We've got all kinds of, of metadata here in the form. Um, and of course, you can control what you see on this form. But I'm just going to go ahead and skip most of this here for the sake of demonstration. Um, and what I'm going to say here is that I made a PDF collection. I gave it a title. Now I'm saying its model is a collection. Um, I'm just going to say. So here we have an empty collection. Nothing's in it. You don't see our nice image gallery underneath. You don't have any you know, descriptive metadata in it. But what you do see here is a link to the item in Fedora. So you can go see it here. Um, you can see everything there. Uh, that add en there, that just means that it's in English. If we were to actually go translate the content, say into French, you would see at fr instead. Um, everything is indexed with its language properly. Um, and so now if I want to go and add a member to this collection, I can click on its members tab. And then we kind of go through the same um, setup here. So we say I want to make a repository item. Um, and I'm going to call this uh, a test PDF. And make sure I, OK. And I'm going to call this a digital document, because that's what it is. And you can see, because we went through those links here, it's already filled out the member of field for us. So this is going to be a member of this collection. All right. So I'm going to save it. OK. And what I did is I created a stub object here. It's an empty object. You can see it's preserved in Fedora. Um, but it doesn't have any files in it yet. So I got to go actually add the files. And we can do that. So we just created the object. And now in Islandor 7 terms, we're going to add the data streams. right? So we can go to media here. And we say we add a media. Um, and I'm going to give it a PDF. So I'm going to say we're going to add a file. 
I'm going to browse. Uh, let me get this config schema cheat sheet. It's a nice PDF I use when I'm working with Drupal. I'm going to call it cheat sheet. And then very important here, we're going to tag this content with a taxonomy term, just like we tagged our collection as a collection and we tagged this um, object as a digital document, we're going to tag this file and we're going to say it's the original file, um, which is kind of our way of saying make some derivatives with it. Now, of course, that's all configurable and you can change that. You could trigger it on any of these things or none, whatever you want, but kind of by default, we say original files get derivatives generated. Okay. So we're going to go ahead and then you see it automatically fills out this media of field two so everything gets linked back up. So we're going to go ahead and save this PDF. Okay. And it automatically redirects you back to kind of the, the main content view there. But you can see we've got this PDF. It says it's a member or media of this test PDF. You got a download link here, right? Um, if you want to see it that way, which isn't terribly exciting. Um, let's go back. Oh no, don't do this to me. There we go. Uh, sorry about that folks, zoom controls get in the way a little bit. Um, if we go back to our test PDF though, so you're gonna see we already extracted a f uh, an image from it automatically, derivatives kinda kicked off there. And so if we go look at media now, it doesn't just have one, it actually has three. Um, so we go ahead and we made, this is the original file, and you can see we tagged other things. Here's a like a, a medium-sized picture of the front page. We're calling out a service file, and then we've got a, a small thumbnail that we that we go ahead and extract too. Um, and that was all done with one of our microservices for for converting images. Um, and so if we go back now, we can check out this PDF. We know that this PDF is a member of the PDF collection. If we go back here, you're going to see that it's automatically going to get populated in our little image gallery here. So all of this is kind of kind of automatic if you if you follow through the, the right steps. Um, we could do the same with some other files. I could upload some other object types, but just keeping an eye on the clock here. Um, I'll show off maybe one more kind of nice thing, and this is kind of a, a snazzy thing that we get from from a third party module. But when we put up the sandbox, some content, it already got created, but it wasn't a member of any collection. So I'm gonna go ahead and throw all of that into this collection, you know, whether or not it's a PDF, um, just so we can see this image gallery get a little bit bigger. But instead of going through each of these objects one by one, like I could go and I could edit this and then I could say that you're, you know, scroll down to the bottom and that you're a member of something and go edit this field for everything. Um, for one or two things, sure, that's fine. For a hundred things, you know, in a way, right? Um, and so if you want to do some stuff in bulk, I'll show you a nice example of that. Uh, so let's go back to the site here. You can see we've got this batch edit link up here in the menu. So this, again, is also a view, just like the slideshow, just like the members image gallery, just like everything else. Um, most everything is a view. So this is a view uh, that uses the, the views bulk edit uh, module. And so what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna take a bunch of these things that are here and I am gonna slurp it into the PDF collection. Um, and so we've got some stuff here. This one isn't even a PDF, it's just an image someone made with paint. And uh, this one actually is, I believe a PDF of a scrape of islandora.ca exported as a PDF. Um, So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take all of these, these three right here. I'm going to take these three right here, and I am going to check these checkboxes. And I can perform any action I want on these things. Um, and this is also configurable what you, what you show to users as to what they can do. Um, and we're going to use this one here called modify field values. What it's going to do is it's going to bring us to a form that we can, we can play with here. And what I'm going to say is I'm going to change field member of, and I'm going to change it to the PDF collection. I'm going to apply. And now it's going to perform a batch operation on these. All right. It modified three values. And so if we go down here, actually, you can see now all of these are members of the PDF collection. And if you click on the PDF collection, when we come in, now you can see all of these things are added to this to this gallery view 
automatically. And so we can click on them and, and check them out um, and do fun things like, even though this is a silly picture, I wonder if it's a PNG or not. I think I can, let's see what happens if I do this. There we go. So we can zoom in and out on our nice smiley face with Open Sea Dragon. Uh, but you can just kind of see all the things that are really possible to do through the UI that are all built on using Drupal's native features. You know, we're really standing on the shoulders of a giant here and we're just taking advantage of kind of everything that, that Drupal gives us. And because of that, it just opens up a whole new kind of world of possibilities for us. Um, I am aware though of the time, we are at 1.40 here. So maybe I'll just take a step back for a second and let people ask questions. And if there aren't any, then I can just continue with some, with some cool demos. All right, we're gonna use the, the hands raised feature so I can unmute you if you have a question or you can type it into the chat and I'll read it out for Danny. Does anybody have any questions? Uh, Noah Smith asks, can Danny elaborate on Carafe? Hmm, Carafe, sure, I can. Um, a little technical here, but so what Carafe is, is if I go back to the presentation um, and I check out our diagram that I made. Do, 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 do. Okay, so this bit in the center called, I got a pointer actually, this bit in the center here called Alpaca. Um, this is some Java code that we wrote in a framework called Camel. Uh, it is a framework specifically built to make middleware, which is exactly what we're trying to do here. Um, so this stuff doesn't have a whole lot of logic in it. It's not real smart, um, but what it does do, it does very well and it does so very reliably and will run essentially forever. Um, it's not the type of thing that you, you know, you're gonna run and leave it on and it's gonna choke and die on you after a couple hours or, or, or something like that. This is stuff that has to go up and stay up like forever and always be running. Um, and in order to do that, we run it in Carafe. So much like you would, uh, put a web application in PHP and deploy it in Apache, or you would drop a war file into Tomcat and deploy that. Um, you do the same thing here, except what we're making uh, are OSGI bundles is what they're called. Um, and we deploy them in that. So it's essentially the container that runs all of our little bits of Java that connect to all of our other services. And a good way to think of it is in the Islander 7 stack, there was G-Search. Well, Apaca is like three or four other little G searches and all of them are running in this Carafe container. Um, and it goes deeper and there's a lot of neat tricks that you can play with, with OSGI and a container like this. Um, for example, like it, it lets you do kind of hot config changes. You can just go edit your config file and it'll go redeploy all the applications you need to do. Um, and it also acts as like a, a service bus. So we don't take a whole lot of advantage of this. We kind of dabble in it in a couple places. Um, but much like you use dependency injection in Drupal um, and there's a service container that you can grab services out of, um, Carafe does that itself, but it does it like at the container level and it's not really part of the of the code per se. Um, is that enough, Noah? And I can't hear or see what you guys are typing, so I'm a, I'm a little blind here. Sorry, I'm trying to stay on top of the chat and read it out for you, but it's moving. Uh, Noah says, yes, that's great. Um, the next question up is from Mini Hangel, and that is, uh, they are wondering if we have JP2 support yet. Uh, not yet. It's, it's on its way. Uh, there's just some kinks that we got to work out with the, the libraries that are used for that support with Cantaloupe. Um, we did have it at one point in time. 
We found it only worked with a select few JP2s, and we couldn't figure out what the difference was between the ones that worked and the ones that didn't. Um, and so we just sort of tabled that support for a later date. If you want to do something like your zoomable viewer using Open Sea Dragon, um, you can point it at a regular JPEG, not a JP2, or you can upload a TIFF, and you can point it at the TIFF directly. Um, but we can't serve that JP2 yet, not because we have problems serving it, but because we have problems actually generating it from the TIFF using open source software where you're not, you know, violating any like, you know, license agreements or terms of service or whatever in order to use it. Uh, next is a question from Tommy. Uh, is there a working group for strategizing on book objects? No, there's not, but I think the regulars who are attempting to do so, many being one of the fine folks who's doing that, um, we meet at the at the clock hall fairly regularly, but that is an excellent idea for kind of a, a short term, you know, interest group or focus group. Okay. Uh, Kara asks, uh, do the Drupal fields get mapped to Fedora? Yes, they do. In, um, in a way, using a core feature of Drupal that's sort of in like a dusty corner of Drupal that I think most people don't really know about or, or see the, the benefit of. Um, and we're, we're taking um, huge advantage of it. Um, so there is a way to map fields into RDF using configuration in Drupal called an RDF mapping. Now, before, when I said that most everything is done with a UI, this is basically the one thing that is not done in a UI yet, um, per se. So there's no form to go edit that mapping, but you can, from the website, get that mapping as raw YAML and go play with it in the text field and then re-upload it, and, and you can work with it that way. Um, and that is something that we've, we're, you know, it's on the horizon, um, and we know it would be a great feature to be able to ship with, would be to have forms for all of that stuff, um, but it just, we just haven't gotten really the opportunity to, to do that yet. Uh, Tammy asks, what metadata appears in the gallery view? like in that image gallery, uh, whatever you want. Uh, right now, I have it set up to just show a picture. But any of the other stuff, you know, you could put name and, and title or a description uh, next to it if you wanted to. It's all just done in the view, um, which if this will let me go to it, I can actually just show it to you super fast. So all of these things that you, you see are totally configurable. That slideshow, the image gallery, uh, that list of collections, kind of all of it. Um, but if you go to the sandbox and once we unlock it, you can come play with this, you know, to your heart's content. Um, sandbox members image gallery is what I named it, a bit long on the tooth. Um, but you can come here and, and if you see here fields, we can just go ahead and add whatever we want. So I'll just go ahead and add like title to it. say apply here. Um, and so this is underneath here. So if we save this, we should be able to see the name show up. But any field will show up. Um, so let's go back to the, if I go back to site. Let's go, excuse me, I'm bumping around here. Let's go to that collection. Okay, and now you can see we've got the name has appeared underneath. Um, and of course, it comes out kind of raw, right? Like you would probably need some some CSS touch-ups um, with this sort of thing. But you you can you can completely control the display. You can make it not a grid. If you want it to just be like a list, vertical list, you can you can do all that stuff too. Okay, uh, Ricardo asks, what is the database backend you're using? I think the Fedora is now one alternative, but can you also use the Drupal database, correct? Correct. And what are the benefits of using Fedora now with this version? 
so so Fedora isn't the database backend, um, and that's kind of a, a key point. From Drupal's perspective, we interact with it in two ways. We interact with it as a file system, and that's really what it is. Um, as far as Fedora, as far as Drupal is concerned, when it sees Fedora, it works with it like a file system, just like public files. So when you go upload stuff, you say, I wanted to go to Fedora, um, and, and that's where we'll go. And it will, it will directly talk to it that way. But when you're looking at this stuff and you're clicking on these um, items, this metadata that's getting put out here, this is not coming from Fedora. This is coming from Drupal's database. Um, and so you have the option of using any of the databases that work with Drupal, which is basically MySQL or variants like Percona or MariaDB um, or Postgres, which is what I would use. Um, this right now, and I'm biased, don't, don't let that influence you. Um, this is running on MySQL and it runs, it runs just fine. Um, what is the benefit of using Fedora now that it's not quote unquote the database for the application? Um, and the, the benefit is really is that it's the preservation layer and it does the more preservation-y um, things, stuff that Drupal doesn't necessarily do or care about. Um, so we use it to do our fixity checks and stuff like that. Uh, it has an audit trail with it. Um, and, and also the way the versioning works is, is, is really nice. Um, the, the memento format is, is excellent. Um, and so we use Fedora for those preservation-y things. Not to mention that it's just, it's another spot where you can go put all of, all of your stuff if you want to. Um, that, that's just speaking from the preservation standpoint. There are, of course, new features with Fedora um, 4 and 5 that are a little bit outside of the realm of what Fedora 3 did. Um, and not everybody is going to take advantage of that, but some people do want to do that. And one of the big things that you can do with it is really for publishing your repository as linked data on the web. Um, so some folks want to just kind of keep it hidden away behind the firewall and have it be part of, you know, just their institution. But some folks are really keen on taking all of that data and kind of putting it out read only for the whole rest of the world to see via LDP. And so Fedora will also do that for you uh, if you're so inclined. Okay, next question is from David. There was a concern a while back about doubling storage, specifically that an object would be stored in both Drupal and Fedora. Has that been resolved to allow single storage? And can you please elaborate? Yes. And this is David, is this David Wilcox? Uh, Kaiser Clark. David Kaiser Clark, okay, hey. Um, so yes, that has been solved. And, and that was solved with Fly System. So at the very beginning, uh, in kind of a naive way, it was when something came in, we would just go make a copy of it and go shuffle it into Fedora. And, you know, obviously that's not going to work out very well if you've got, you know, multiple gigabyte, like huge raw video files. You definitely don't want to be making copies of those. Um, so by integrating with Fedora as a file system, um, you get to choose where things go. So um, by default, it's, it's part of the field itself's configuration, okay? But if I go into um, our media and I actually go and edit the fields, when I go there, hang on, a couple, I'm a couple clicks away. Um, the one that actually holds the file, where is it, right here. When you go to its field settings, you can say where you want it to go through the UI. So here you can say, I want it to go to the Drupal public, or here I want it to go to Fedora, or you can mount other disks and put them on other disks or put them in AWS or whatever. Whatever you've kind of connected Fly system to will all show up in this, in this menu. Now, when you generate derivatives, because you're not uploading them and it's kind of done like automatically for you, there's another spot where you have to go touch things up. But if you, and I might as well show this to you now, this is a, a good opportunity to show this off. If we go to the actions that generate the derivatives, we can also there, there's basically a, a, a form widget that lets you specify which file system you want it to go to. And so you can say whether you want your derivatives to go like into Fedora for preservation, or if you want them to go you know, onto the public file system or some sort of CDN for like faster serving. Um, 
let's go ahead and look at one here like yeah, generate a service file from an original file for an image so if we go here is our form to actually control how we generate the derivatives and here you can see where you get to choose the file system so there's kind of two spots where you got to go do it um, but yeah, you have complete control over what goes where and when and how. Um, next question is from Don. What happens if we start with Fedora? Is communication between Drupal and Fedora a two-way conversation, or should we, do we, we be doing all of our conversation through Drupal? Communication through Drupal. Sorry, Don. Good question. So when we first started, we really wanted to be able to go kind of bi-directionally. Um, and we found out that that mapping from Drupal native stuff to RDF, it really only goes one way. It goes from the Drupal database into RDF. If you take stuff from RDF and you try to map it back into that database, you can totally do it. Um, you just have to make assumptions. And us trying to serve like everybody with everybody's needs, we can't just start making assumptions because then we're going to start blocking people out. And we realized we couldn't do it super generically. And so we just tabled it, you know, focus on the other direction, get everything working good. And then I know there are other community members that are interested in it and want to do it. And it might be something that happens later on. But for now, everything should really go through Drupal. You're talking to Drupal as the control panel for your repository. So kind of all of the requests need to go through that. And, and to that effect, also, um, Drupal is also like the gateway to all of your files as well. So if you've got your files in AWS and some of them in Fedora and some of them in, you know, like the public file system, the, the best place to access all of those things is also through Drupal because it's going to check to see like what user are you and do you have permissions to see this or not. And then it's going to handle the details of like logging into AWS and getting a token and pulling the file down for you and stuff like that. So it kind of hides all of the details of what you're connected to if you just stick with Drupal. Okay, uh, next question I think is technically a follow up to the carafe question, so I'm going to translate it slightly. Uh, Gavin asks if we're going to get a diagram of those layers too, which I believe means are we going to get, we're going to get that diagram that isn't just painting with a broad brush. The huge one. Yeah, it doesn't really fit on a screen. <laughs> but we can, we can do that and slowly but surely we will we, we do have some stuff that's from the original MVP that is very close. Um, believe it or not, in the, like, the three years of development of the software, what landed, the 1.0.0 release, is fairly close, like pretty darn close to the MVP, considering that you know, we didn't know 100% of everything before we started. So we have some stuff there that I can dust off, but it definitely needs to get touched up, for sure. Uh, Gavin will accept poster size. You'll accept poster size? Okay, because that's, yeah, that's what it would take. All right, scrolling up. Um, Don asks, um, OAI PMH, question mark, exclamation point, question mark. <laughs> <laughs> OAI PMH support in Island or 8, Danny. Uh, we're working on it. So there are a couple folks interested in that. Um, UPEI got a grant to do some RDM features and add that to Islandora 8. That's covered under part of that grant. And another institution that's starting a pilot project, correct me if I'm wrong, I believe Kent State, Melissa. That's um, They have also done a, a first pass at creating an OAI PMH endpoint. And what it does is it, it integrates with the Drupal meta tags module and it sees what you've set up for meta tags for Dublin core and then it scrapes those out and it, it spits out a, a, some Dublin core XML. Okay, we're at the hour now, but we are recording. So we'll just keep going till we get through all these questions. And if anybody has to leave, you can uh, 
You can get the answers on the recording afterwards. We'll send that out. So the next question is from Ricardo again, and it is what kind of SIP do you support to make the automated ingestion of digital objects into Islandora? What facilities do you offer to automate submission using XML based SIPs? And that's SIPs with a capital SIP. Okay, submission information package, I believe. Um, so if you wanna upload stuff or ingest stuff right now, um, you can do what I did and sort of manually add things. Uh, you know, obviously that doesn't scale, right? Um, if you want to ingest multiple things or maybe f things that might come packaged a little bit differently, um, then you are using the migrate framework at that point. We already have a lot of tooling out. I didn't really get into it because it's a little bit of a deeper kind of feature. Um, but the, the Drupal Migrate framework has facilities for working with just about every type of file you could imagine, um, particularly XML, so it has XPath support. And so what you can do is it's, it's kind of weird. It's something that's more of a power usery kind of thing. Um, but instead of writing a migration into Drupal with code, you can actually configure one um, using some third party modules and that looks like YAML. And again, like the RDF mapping, it's like a really complicated beast. So it doesn't really have a form yet. You're just kind of manipulating the YAML manually. Um, but you can with that YAML basically ingest whatever you want. Um, so for example, for the tooling that we have to take us from Islandora 7 into Islandora 8, we request the Foximal from Fedora, which comes out as XML, and then we use the Migrate framework to like hack things out with XPaths and then use that to create Drupal nodes. Um, and you could use that similarly if, if your metadata is based on a format, you know, like mods or PB core or something like that, and that's where you've got everything and you wanted to, uh, to migrate in, you would be basically writing one of those little YAML blobs that would line up your XPaths and your fields, and then it would slurp things in. Okay, next question kind of overlaps with something we already said, but it is a very important question. Uh, Don asks, how would you migrate a large set of content from Islandora 7 to this? Well, we do have my, uh, migration tools for it. Um, we have tried with smaller sets in order to just verify the proof of concept. No one has run through a monster migration yet. So I'm not sure how it's gonna perform with, you know, a hundred terabytes worth of stuff yet. Like we haven't tried. Um, but I imagine it will do fairly well and would hit, hit a tipping point. And if you manage to reach that tipping point, then you would be on the line to, to just use our REST API to, to stick stuff in. You know, that would be kind of like the best fallback. But I would start with our migration tools because we have spent a lot of time trying to figure out how to really best get everyone from seven into eight. And we'll try to make that work. And then if it really starts to sag, if you got like a super huge collection, then we'll, we'll play it by ear from there. Uh, next question is from a different Don. Uh, will there be a solar module or something related to getting facets integrated into search results? Yes, yes, there will be, yes. Sorry, excitedly, yes. Um, so there already is a solar search API module that's in there. And so one of the nice kind of things about it, like in 7X, if you wanted to get your stuff into solar, you had to know and understand XSLTs or have a really good friend who knows and understands XSLTs. Um, in order to break apart all that XML and get it into, into solar format. Um, we have a module that does that now. I'm kind of scrolling for it now, if I can find it. And we have it very lightly configured right now. So if I, let me see, I got database, search API, solar search, okay. So I can use this and control what gets in my index. And I believe also play with facets. We just haven't gotten there yet and found a good way 
to have a set of defaults that we pass around that we know. Um, but once we do, we will 100% ship with that. Faceting is it's it's totally um, on the horizon here. Okay, uh, next question. I'm going to assume this might be Gavin again, posting under Noah. Um, can one now store the Fedora data stream in an S3 using Fly system? And is that performant? Um, also, the Fedora object stream store directory too in S3, or is this conflating some things? So you can, you can kind of go about it in different ways, and I guess it really depends on, on, on what you want to do. Um, we built this this way because not every fedora so you can potentially have multiple fedora implementations because there is an api and not everyone is super thrilled about that external content feature because it can um it can introduce some security vulnerabilities if you if you don't know exactly what you're doing when you're doing it um so what we did is we decided we would take that on if not every fedora committed to doing that then we said well you know what we're going to make sure that everyone can do that if they want to so you can certainly do it at the fedora level if you have an implementation like the community one that that does um, but forward looking maybe you don't and so um, we we chose to go through fly system with that um, i have personally played with fly system um, with fedora and then I did a demo with Dropbox. Um, I personally have not done the AWS one, but I know that of all of the fly system adapters, it's the one that gets the most use and it's often used um, as a CDN for Drupal. And that's what people are using it for. Um, so I personally have not done that, but yes, it is possible. And I can't speak to its performance yet because I haven't seen it, but I imagine of all of them, it's probably the best. I can tell you that the Dropbox performance wasn't so stellar um but i was also on a free account and 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 everything else um but yeah i i imagine that it would it would go quite well we certainly are 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 planning on it because that's one of the major draws of it is being able to use you know aws okay next question i think this may actually be our last question uh Jimena, Jimena asks, uh, we have uh, 515,000 objects in an Islandora 7 repository using mods for metadata. Uh, will there be some way to import them into this version? Yes. Um, import the whole object or import the mods file itself? Because you can do both. Um, if you use the migration tooling that we have now, you would get all of that content over you would get all of your files your data streams over and so your xml like your mods would live in your fedora just like it's living in your fedora 3 it's going to live in your fedora 5 and it's going to be linked to an object that has like descriptive metadata on it that's that's all going to be roughly the same um, in order to get that kind of special sauce and everything that that drupal does you need to have your content stored as fields so when you do that migration um, tool and you run it um, you can actually choose what you want to pull out of the metadata and apply that to whatever field you want as well. So when you, when you do try the migration tool, you will get the file as is untouched at the time that it came over. And then you will also get it transformed into fields for to, you to use um, as you go forward. And then if you wanted to keep spitting out mods XML files for something like OAI PMH, and that's, that's something we're working on um, for you to be able to, to export it into, into specific formats in a very configurable way. That is it for the questions I see in chat. If anybody has any other questions or if I missed your question, um, please raise your hand or post it now. Otherwise, thank you very much, everyone, for joining us. Thanks for the wonderful questions. And thank you very much, Danny, for, for throwing this all together and uh, demoing live. Yeah, it's my pleasure. Uh, thanks, everyone.
So um, I have been recording this session. I will uh, try to get that recording online and I'll follow up with everyone with um, some links, these slides, the recording and uh, get more information out to you.